All right. Welcome everyone to this STEM student talk at the fifth at the fifth Polygen Symposium of Rising Scholars. The goal of the symposium is to celebrate and publicize the hard work of our Polygen scholars, all of whom have worked tirelessly on their projects over the past couple of months. I am Tyler. I'm the Student Success Coordinator at Polygens. We have a full roster of amazing uh, projects to share with you today. In this session, we have three really awesome student presenters presenting on a variety of topics. In this room, we also have our judge, who is Brianna Marsh. She is a PhD candidate in computational neuroscience at University of California, San Diego. So everybody say hi to Brianna in the chat. She'll be judging the presentation along with me as a moderator. Um, and so our lineup today of student presenters is Jack. He's a senior at Cypress Woods High School. Chris, a senior at Appleton North High School. And Chandana, a senior at North Hills Preparatory High School. And just as a reminder, if we have a few people coming in now, make sure that any questions, if you have questions to ask, put that in the Q&A within this session as opposed to the event Q&A. Um, and we're really excited to get started. So Jack, I'm gonna allow you to now share your screen and you can take it away. Again, at six minutes, I'll rejoin so that you'll see me pop up as an indicator that you have two minutes remaining. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Um, can you guys see the presentation clearly? Yes. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Jack Lee, and I am currently a senior at Cypress Woods High School uh, in Cypress, Texas. Today, I'll be discussing a research paper that I wrote this summer with politicians titled A Machine Learning Based Early Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease. So, I'd like to first introduce the problem regarding Alzheimer's disease, or AD. According to the Alzheimer's Association, AD accounts for 60 to 80% of dementia cases worldwide. Its occurrences also increases dramatically with age, with individuals aged 85 or older more than seven times as likely to have AD than those aged 65 to 74. Moreover, because there's no cure, an early diagnosis is especially useful since it can both prolong brain function and better prepare patients and their families for the future. A common step in the diagnosis of AD is through brain imaging, such as MRIs, CTs, or PET scans. For our study, we'll be focusing on the MRI, which is usually a three-dimensional scan of a patient's whole brain. Due to how complex the scan can be, um, machine learning and computer vision has been getting traction in their analysis. So if you were to look at the two figures on the right here, the, um, you can clearly see that the Alzheimer's brain has much, um, much more dark matter compared to the healthy brain. This is indicative of the brain essentially shrinking, but more accurately, the decaying of the gray matter within the brain, and th thereby allowing the space to be filled with the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds it. A computer vision model would be looking for these patterns, creating a prediction for each patient status based on how their brain, how, based on how their brain structure compares to other patients of each class. So what is the progression of AD like? The first, step of the first type of patients are those considered cognitively normal, or CN. These are people with no significant neurological impairment beyond what is regular of aging. Next, there is mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. MCI is a subjective memory concern within a patient, um, which means there may be some problems with memory, but everyday living activities are maintained with little to no impairment. And it's also often classified into stages, ranging from early MCI to late MCI. Finally, there is Alzheimer's disease itself, which is, as before, the most common form of dementia in the world, characterized by a complete loss of memory function, as well as significant impairment in daily life in its final stages. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research on Alzheimer's, but unfortunately, there's no cure. So early detection, but early detection can significantly help with this. One of the areas we'll be focusing on in this presentation is MCI. There exists research that questions the validity of MCI as a precursor to Alzheimer's, with the main concerns being its sensitivity or true positive rate and specificity or true negative rate as a marker for Alzheimer's disease. Because of this, because of this the general consensus is that MCI is a risk factor for Alzheimer's and not a diagnostic marker for early diagnosis. So with that in mind, here are the two questions we are trying to solve. 
First, can we use computer vision with MRI scans as a computational support for medical personnel in the task of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease? Second, are there significant structural differences in the brains of MCI patients that make MCI a clear and separate entity from CN and AD? For this study, we used the ADNI and OASIS datasets, which are two of the most widely used datasets in research on Alzheimer's. From these two datasets, we have 7,000 MRI images, which as you may expect, would be very hard for a human radiologist or even a full team of them to analyze and create diagnoses for. Because of this, machine learning, which can generate a usable model in a matter of several hours, could very likely be used as a support tool by these radiologists to significantly reduce their workload. The reason we chose to use two data sets is to both increase the generalizability of our model, as well as to determine if MCI is a valid separation stage between patients that are cognitively normal and those that are affected by Alzheimer's disease. As you can see in the demographics shown here, ADNI separates their scans into CN, MCI, and AD, whereas OASIS only separates their scans into CN and AD. By training our model on the ADNI dataset and evaluating on the OASIS dataset, we would create something that would likely reclassify some of the OASIS patients as MCI, if there indeed were significant brain structural differences between the three classes. For the model used in our study, we used a convolutional neural network due to its high usability and performance in computer vision tasks. This is mainly because a CNN works similar to how the human vision system works, where we learn not just from what we see, but also where we see it relative to everything else in the picture. In this case, it would be learning things like the edges of a face or the curves within a brain. And as it goes deeper and deeper, it would learn more specific parts of the, of the subject, such as the eyes of the face or the hippocampus within a brain. Um, it would use these um, things that it sees to create a prediction, thereby giving us our predictive machine learning model. Specifically for our study, we use the DenseNet 121 architecture that is presented in the paper, a low-cost three-dimensional DenseNet neural network for Alzheimer's disease early discovery. So I've touched on this before, but what makes, what makes machine learning exactly good for this? Look at the graph on the left here, which plots the hippocampal volume of a patient as a function of their age. There's a huge amount of overlap between the two classes. While a human radiologist may, to a degree, be able to diagnose their patients given the location on the graph, it will be extremely difficult to do so accurately because of this aforementioned overlap. Furthermore, a two-dimensional graph such as this can really only show two summary features, in this case, the hippocampal volume and the age. Given that in a study such as this, where there are much more than two features within a brain, a graph like this can leave out a lot of important information in the diagnosis process, which is where machine learning comes in. Using methods of dimensionality reduction, we can create something that's able to condense multiple summary features, which in our case is 16, into just two dimensions, while also creating a clear and usable separation boundary for diagnosis. This is seen on the graph on the right here. Um, not only does it contain much more information about a patient than the previous graph, it also makes it simpler for a medical professional to predict whether an unknown patient would be affected by Alzheimer's dementia, depending on where they lie on this graph. So let's discuss the primary results of our model now. The two figures here show confusion matrices, which compare the label predicted by our model with the actual label of that subject. On the left, we have a confusion matrix showing the results when we both train and evaluate our model using the ADNI dataset. During this scenario, the model had a best case accuracy of 86%, with a sensitivity or true positive rate of 99% when classifying patients affected by Alzheimer's disease, indicating that it may be applicable in a clinical scenario. On the right, we have a confusion matrix showing the results when we train on the ADNI dataset and evaluate on the OASIS dataset. As expected, the accuracy here is much lower, but it still mostly succeeds at classifying these two classes, which we believe is a good outcome considering the differences between the two datasets. Of interest here, both scenarios show that a large amount of patients are classified into the stages of MCI. Looking particularly at the figure on the right here, um, in this spot that I'm pointing at, you can see that a large amount of OASIS patients are now being reclassified um, into the MCI as of their respective CN or AD classes. Since the model that we're making is looking at the brain structure within the MRI, these results indicate that indeed there are significant brain structural differences between the MCI patients and CN or AD patients. So to conclude, there's still a lot of work that must be done before we can truly implement this into uh, the diagnosis process. However, I believe this to be a good step towards that. Our machine learning model could very likely be used as a support tool for radiologists. And we've also confirmed that there are structural differences between MCI, CN, and AD, making this a separate entity and a possible indicator of um, Alzheimer's disease for the early diagnosis that we are looking for. 
So in closing, I'd like to thank my mentor, Zach, who brought me from someone with almost no knowledge of machine learning to where I am today. Without him and the help of the entire Polygence community and team, I would not have been able to do this. And finally, to accompany my project, I've also created a web-based interface that displays the data. So with that said, feel free to ask me any questions you may have or contact me with the email address listed below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Awesome job. Do you mind, it would be cool if you can also put that database, the link into the chat in case people wanna uh, take a closer look at that. That would be cool to include there. And so at this point, we'll open it up for any questions for Jack. This can happen in two ways. You can either chat them in, you can put them into the Q&A, or you can request to come on screen to ask your question if you rather do it face-to-face. -face. Uh, so we'll, we'll let the questions roll in a little bit. Um, but Jack, one question that I have is, um, so I know you're taking from uh, two dimensions to 15 dimensions. Can you tell me a little bit more about like what's included in all those extra dimensions that are being added into that model? Yeah, of course. So um, with, the, sorry, with, with the dimensions, it's not exactly taken from two to 16, it's taking from 16 to two for the, mostly so that we can, I guess, look at every data there is. So these dimensions would include things like the different volumes of each part of the brain, such as the hippocampal or the cortex or like the surface area of the brain. Um, so with all of these combined together into two dimensions, we essentially create something that um, has is very dense on information of each patient, thereby essentially each point in, um, includes every single piece of data available for that patient. Um, and then when we graph it on two dimensions, we can have the things like that clear separation line that we had before. Awesome. I'm going to open, add in Brianna here. Hello, Neil. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, I had um, a couple of questions for you about your project. It sounds super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so generally when we talk about using um, MRI data and a convolutional neural network, my assumption was that you fed in the raw image of the fMRI. It sounds like that may be not the case where you extracted some features. So what exactly was your input to the CNN? Um, for the CNN itself, the input was a pre-processed MRI. So where we, because the data sets, they, the, the ranges of the data range like 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the pixel information of each data is different. So each scan, we had to pre-process them to get them to a common dimensions and like focus on the brain itself instead of the skull or everything else. Um, so that's what we fed into the, uh, um, the CNN for the classification of the MRI. For the dimensionality, dimensionality reduction that I showed as an example there, that is, um, so OASIS has free surfer extracted data, which is essentially, um, they calculate the volumes of each MRI um, for each parts of the brain. Um, and that gives us tabular data of information uh, of the brain of a patient. So for the dimensionality reduction and the um, showcase of what machine learning, why machine learning is good for this, that is what I use for this, the tabular data, since that is more difficult to do than with um, a picture. Okay, great. Um, and then I also was wondering, um, you mentioned that deep net network did you use, did you use that as a pre-trained network or did you just replicate the structure? Um, we replicated the structure of that because um, they, they've done a lot of the main work on hyperparameter optimization, mm -hmm. which is, that was the focus of their study. The focus of ours was just to see if it's applicable applicable for this and also to um, apply it to another data set to investigate um, whether MCI was a valid separation stage. So we used um, their publicly available uh, pre-trained model to do our analysis of the ADMI data set and the OASIS data set. Okay, so you did use the pre-trained model? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. I guess I'll leave. <laughs> you can you can leave and that, that'll keep you in the room, but it won't like okay. it'll take your screen. It'll leave it very bad. No problem. Thank you. Okay. I have one more person asking to share. Let me see. Juan, I let you uh, share your screen in case you want a question. If you if you want to put it in the chat, you can also do it there. But awesome. Thank you so much, Jack. That was a really awesome presentation. And mm -hmm. next up, we are going 
to move on to Chris. So if you click leave, or I can click it for you, uh, okay. you'll stop sharing, and then we can bring Chris on. Because you popped up really quick and then you disappeared. If you can ask to, there you go. Is it working now? <laughs> yep, all set. And I can hear you perfect in everything. Perfect. Thank you. Take it away. Um, give me one second. I'm have Windows. Yes, perfect. Can you see my screen? It's loading. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, then I'll begin now. All right. Hello, my name is Herman Lee. I go by Chris, and today my review is going to be on face therapy against antibiotic resistant pathogens. So, basically, what are phages? So, phages, which is short for bacteria phage, is a type of virus that affects bacteria instead of humans. So, phages can be divided up into two components. First, the capsid, which is the head, which contains the uh, um, DNA information for the phage. And next, we have the tail fiber and the base plate. Oh, sorry, I see the audio. Can everyone hear me? Maybe let's just try again. Maybe if you stop sharing and and then come back on, it we can hear you. It's just like a little um, mumbled. Oh, okay. Um, it's it's oddly better when I'm also here. So maybe if you share now. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? It's good. Okay. Sorry about that. Do you want me to start from the beginning then? Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Am I good to go? Awesome, all right. Hello everyone again, my name is Hyungmin Lee. I go by Chris, and today I'll be presenting on phage therapy against antibiotic resistant pathogens. So specifically, what are phages? So phages are also known as bacteriophages are a type of virus that infect bacteria instead of humans. So um, you can usually divide the phages into two different parts. First, the capsid, which includes the viral DNA, and the tail fiber and base plate, which is what the phage uses to attach on to bacterial cells. And these viruses multiply and um, multiply through a process called the lytic cycle. So just a general overview of the lytic cycle, the phage itself would first attach on to the bacterial cell, which would then um, the DNA would merge with the, plas the, the bacteria's plasmid, um, replicating more phages within the bacteria. And once there are too many bacteria inside the, um, too many phages within the bacteria, the bacteria will, bacteria cell will burst open, also known as a process called lysis. And um, new phages will emerge from that and just go on to mutate and um, repeat the lytic cycle once more. So phage therapy is using this unique behavior of lysis on a bacterial cells to treat bacterial infections. So this is another image of a, a phage. But for a history-wise, phage therapy is kind of like using like an ex um, using like an organism to fight against the diseases. So it kind of seems sci-fi, more recent. But in reality, it was discovered in 1915 during the height of World War One. But the only reason, the one of the reasons why phage therapy did not become prominent was because of antibiotic resistant pathogens, um, antibiotic resistance, yeah, antibiotics. So anti um, antibiotics had two main benefits. First is mass production. Um, and second is general application to um, not just specific um, infections, but just in general to not just one species, but other species as well. And because of that, um, phage therapy lost its prominence. But Recently, phage therapy has become more relevant. And the reason behind this is because of antibiotic resistant pathogens. So as um, although antibiotics um, give the benefit of mass use and um, efficiency, um, because these are so generally applicable, 
it's harder to find the right drug for each infection, causing um, increased drug resistance generation and creating just more and more um, antibiotic resistance or ADR pathogens. Specifically, we, um, our main con concerns are the escape pathogens. ESCAPE is an acronym for the most dangerous antibiotic resistant pathogens, including Enterococcus facia, Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsia pneumoniae, uh, Acinobacter bomani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the Enterobacter species. And today we'll be diving deeper and deeper into the E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the Acinobacter bomani bacterium. So just like a general overview before I begin, E. coli is actually a part of our microbiota, but it becomes dangerous when it enters um, other parts of our body, such as besides the digestive tract. Um, next, um, we'll be going over the aureus, which is most well known for its methicillin resistance, um, also known as MRSA. And next, we'll be going through the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a respiratory infection-inducing pathogen. And finally, we'll go with, end with the Bomani, which is um, easily spread in hospital and war zones, giving it the moniker the Iraqi Bacter from um, the Iraq War. So um, considering our human pace, I thought we were going to be more developed, more like, in commercial use, almost at commercial use, but it's phage therapy is mostly in in vivo trials and clinical trials. And for instance, one E. coli study showed that randomized clinical trials, it demonstrated safety within the patients, but the study groups didn't really have that much um, comparable outcomes in comparison to the placebo. And, and um, moreover, phage therapy has not been developed as much into clinical and human trials yet. And this may be because phage therapy is so specific to each strain of bacterium that it's hard to find, it takes more time to find the specific strain of phage that we need. However, in general, phage therapy is very promising. So first, um, a study from, a study on phage therapy against Bomani showed that even with the low multiplicity of infection, it is shown to diminish bacterial growth. So as you can see on this um, graph of concentration versus time, we see that in, even in comparison to the control, even with the low multiplicity of infection, um, we can still reduce bacterial growth, which is um, really good to hear because it shows that phage therapy does work. And it even raised the survival rate of the phage infected group to 90% while the control remained at only 10%. And um, another study that supports the beneficial bene benefits of phages is that for an aeruginosa clinical trial, we can see that in the graph comparing the percentage of participants with the um, bacterial reduction, phage therapy has that longer sustained reduction for um, around 150 hours before it reaches 40% of patients without the reduction, while the standard of care reaches 40% by around 50 hours. So almost a 100 hour difference of bacterial reduction gained from phage therapy. In addition, um, a Staphylococcus aureus also showed that it reduced the area of infection as well as the colony concentration. So before we move on, there is one graphic image of animal research. If you are not comfortable, please, um, do not view the slideshow until I tell you it's okay, but I will be clicking to show that image now. But um, as you can see, the phage treated a mice had a much smaller area of infection in comparison to the MRSA. The graphic image is gone, but the graph here also, graph B shows that um, the amount of area of those infection is much smaller in the phage treated in comparison to the MRSA. In addition, the colony forming unit um, in comparison between the just the control and compared to phage therapy shows that phages are much better at reducing that colonies. So in general, we saw different types of species and how phage therapy impacts them. And we can see that phage therapy demonstrates a lot of promise. And something interesting that I found was that phage therapy was most effective when it was used in cocktail form, meaning it was in in, meaning we inject multiple strains of phages within one dose. And there are a lot of speculations regarding why cocktails are so useful. And one of the, re one of the speculations is that because there are more strains attacking one bacteria, the bacteria doesn't have enough time to uh, develop resistance against all the different types. So what an example that I like to use is like soccer. So if we have more, um, if there's four attackers against one goalie, it'll be easier for the goalie 
um, to, uh, easier for the attackers to score a goal in comparison to when there is only one attacker against one goalie, right? And so um, cocktails are very interesting to notice. And in addition, um, clinical trials are in more recruitment and more and more are being registered. So this shows that phage therapy is, there's a lot of interest gaining on phage therapy. And even though ABR pathogen numbers are increasing, with the promises of phage therapy as well as phage cocktail therapy and the increase in clinical trials, um, there is a very positive outlook in this field. And um, hopefully we'll be able, I'm really excited to see what phage therapy can do in the next few years. So um, thank you so much for listening. and. A special thank you to ULIM for being my mentor through Polygens. I've never done research before. I'm from Wisconsin, so Wisconsin, but um, it's been great learning how like research especially works, how to read and like, learning from the foundations. And it was really cool experience. So thank you so much. And um, do you have any questions? Ooh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so again, like last time, if you want to ask a question, you can request to share in the chat, or you can put it in the Q&A or the chat anywhere. I'm looking everywhere. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask away. And I'm bringing on Brianna now to ask. Hello, am I frozen? You're good to me. <laughs> oh, okay. My computer is like frozen right now for a moment. Okay, there we go. Uh, give me one second. <laughs> Is it working now? Sorry, my computer is like, sorry, hey, technical hey. difficulties, but. We're all set, yeah, can you see us? Yes, yeah. we're good now. Hi, um, great talk, it was really interesting. Um, I just had one question. I wonder if you could um, share screen again and go back to the, the graphic image of the mice, so warning. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us what we're looking at there and what we're supposed to see in the differences between those two groups. Uh, can you see my... Mm -hmm. Graph, my slideshow. Perfect. Yes. Um, so I'll zoom in a bit. Mm -hmm. But while we give me a couple moments to slide through the images, but um, in the MRSA infection, that's the control control group. And the area, the white area, as you can see with my cursor, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Okay, yeah. Right here. Um, that part is like where there's an area of infection. And in the control, we can see that area is much bigger, but in the phage treatment, it's almost negligible to see. Um, and this is kind of also reflected in the tape graph that I've shown over here, where the area is much smaller in the phage treatment in comparison to the MRSA. Okay, great, yeah, I just, it was a, I know you went through it a little bit quickly, probably for the people who might not want to see it, but it was great to have that like pointed out of, of where the yep. infected area was and everything. Um, yeah, I think that was my, my only question. This was a really interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you. Again, we'll uh, leave a little more chance for a few more questions to roll in. Um, I'm really interested in this concept of, of the cocktail that you were talking about and kind of using uh, multiple at once for more effective uh, outcomes. And I, I, is this kind of, what the cutting edge is. And this is like when you're saying there's clinical trials and recruit recruitment, is this specifically what they're looking at? Or are they kind of testing one at a time? If you, do you have insight into that? Yeah, so in general, for the studies I looked at, they were running like different types of factors. So they were studying different types of strains for like going against one step one like bacteria, but they also tested like what would happen if they use different combinations of these phase strains, and which was why they found out that like beige cocktails were more useful. So I, um, seeing the clinical trials that are currently in progress, as well as one that I've read, it seems that they're trying to do both at the same time and seeing which one's more effective. But showing like having those two different options kind of gives us better variety, right? Because medical treatment can only go so far with antibiotics, which is only one option. So if we can just continue to diverge and create more um, medical treatments, that's more the better. So I'm really excited to see what happens as well. Great job. Thank you. And then Shandana, I'm about to pull you up um, for your turn, just to give you the heads up. Thanks again so much, Chris. Yep. Should I just press leave then? And then I'll just go. Into the... yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Hi. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yep, I can hear you well. Oh, wait, I have a one second. Sorry. Let me just see. Uh, also, having somebody else ask. I just want to make sure it's not a, another question. Hi, Brianna, did you have a question? Uh, I just want to make sure we're covered before uh, we move on to Chandana's presentation. No worries. <laughs> All right, Chandan, I can hear you, I can see you. Uh, you're all set to take it away. Okay, I'm um, just going to one second to share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. My name is Chandanaka Sapu, and I'd first like to take a moment to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to my presentation. So today I'll be presenting my research that I did over the summer with polygens. Specifically, I'll be uh, discussing the effect of various treatments, physiological and pharmacological, on the mechanisms behind multiple sclerosis. So first, let's talk about the basics. Before we can talk about the mechanisms, let's talk about what even is what even is multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is a central nervous system disorder that is immune system mediated. Um, and what happens is the immune system will uh, systematically destroy uh, myelin or it will damage axons. And this will lead to uh, neurological symptoms that I'll touch on later. But uh, Multiple sclerosis leads to uh, overall body dysfunction. And when I say body dysfunction, what I mean is uh, usually vision loss, pain in the limbs or spine, urinary dysfunction or cognitive disorder. And it's not only physical symptoms. Um, most times it is, um, excuse me, the uh, individuals with MS will deal with uh, mental illnesses as well, such as depression and anxiety amongst others. So right now there is uh, no known cause or cure for multiple sclerosis, but there, uh, it's indicated that multiple sclerosis is caused likely due to a combination of genetics and uh, environmental factors. Um, and in the case of treatment or cures, there is no known cure. However, there are various treatments, both experimental and established to curb pain, to curb pain. Uh, the pr progression of multiple sclerosis, pain relief, and to regain cognitive function. So let's talk a little bit about how to diagnose multiple sclerosis. So in order to diagnose multiple sclerosis, um, you uh, have to take an MRI or a magnetic resonance imaging scan. And so uh, you have to an analyze this scan. And you can see in the uh, figure I have here that um, in, uh, the, you'll see these large white spots on the scan. And what this indicates is accumulation of myelin, uh, which is sort of a protein that's involved in multiple sclerosis, which I'll touch on in a later slide. But uh, scans that have these white matter plaques, which is the name for them, are uh, usually indicative of multiple sclerosis. So how does multiple sclerosis progress? So usually the biggest marker for the progression of multiple sclerosis is the worsening of symptoms. And uh, some, the three of the most common symptoms are in a triad called Charcot's neurological triad. So the first uh, symptom in this triad is dysarthria. And so dysarthria, dysarthria is when uh, the muscles we use for speech, essentially, uh, for lack of a better word, they atrophy. And um, people who experience this uh, struggle to speak or uh, communicate with others. The next symptom is nystagmus. Nystagmus is a vision condition. It was kind of like the vision loss I touched on earlier. Um, it's a vision condition in which the eyes make uncontrolled movements. And so someone with nystagmus won't be able to control uh, which way they look and their eyes, their eyes will kind of be make erratic movements. 
Um, and the next symptom is similar to nystagmus in the uncontrolled part. It's called intention tremor. And so intention tremor is involuntary rhythmic muscle contractions that happen in a voluntary manner. So this is a little tricky because how can something be involuntary and voluntary at the same time? But uh, someone with intention tremor would, uh, if they were doing a, a visually guided movement, like uh, moving their arm up and down, there would be uh, uncontrolled muscle contractions, which would cause their arm to jerk. So the worsening of these symptoms usually indicates uh, one of these three types of MS. So the first type is RRMS, or remitting, re relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, uh, R uh, P, excuse me, SPMS, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, or primary progressive MS, or PPMS. So out of these three types, RRMS is the most common and the most severe. Based on this figure I have, you can see that for RRMS, there's a lot more orange and red, and the orange represents relapse, and the red represents worsening or an incomplete recovery from the relapse. And so uh, compared to the other types, RRMS is the, is the most, uh, has the most worsening of symptoms and the most relapse. And it's for this reason that many treatments target uh, RRMS and the symptoms that come from it rather than the other two. So before we talk about the treatments, let's talk about what the treatments uh, target, so the mechanisms. So the main mechanism behind multiple sclerosis is demyelination. And demyelination occurs in the neuron. So just a brief over, for a brief overview of the neuron, there's three main parts. So this purple part here is the cell body or the soma, and these small branches coming off are the dendrites, and this giant branch coming off is the axon. So the axon is what we, we'll be discussing mostly today, as it is where uh, demyelination and mechanisms occur. So as you can see on the axon, there are these blue sort of caps, um, which are called myelin sheaths. So myelin is kind of a protein sheath, which protects the cell signal when it comes down the axon um, to the synapses to another cell. And what in demyelination, what happens is the immune system will actually destroy this myelin here, and it will leave the axon unprotected and the cell signal uh, without that insulation. So what, what happens to the action potential? The action potential is kind of another word for the cell signal. And what it is, it's a spike of electrical activity caused by depolarizing current, which you can see here, and it travels down the axon to the synapses. Um, and so the word for it is action potential. And how it travels is it bounces across each node of Ron VA. I didn't mention this earlier, but a node of Ron VA is uh, just another word for the gaps between the myelin sheaths. And so that's how the action potential travels. It, it jumps across each node. And this, uh, this process is just called saltatory propagation. So what happens to the action potential and this propagation when there's no myelin or, or if it's been demyelinated? So as you can see in the in B, uh, part, the B part of my figure, um, there is no myelin on this axon. And so what happens is the action potential has to kind of struggle to get, get all the way through the, through the axon without the protection of the myelin or without the um, benefits of salt store propagation within nodes of Ranvier. And so what this does is this can cause a lot of different neurological symptoms like that I touched on before. And what can happen is uh, the nerve impulses that kind of, if we touch something hot, we move our hand right away. Those are the nerve impulses that can be damaged and it can cause a lot of both physical and mental, uh, excuse me, mental deterioration. So what treatments are in place to help stop this kind, these mechanisms and this damage? So currently there are many pharmacological and physiological treatments. Um, one of the most common pharmacological treatment is corticosteroids. And how corticosteroids work is it's an anti-inflammatory medicine and it targets the, the inflammation of nerves, um, specifically uh, some, some of one symptom that's caused by MS is optic neuritis, and that is when the optic nerve is inflamed due to multiple sclerosis. And so corticosteroids, how it works is it will essentially just, it, it's specifically for multiple sclerosis flares and, um, and oh, what's the word? Uh, flares and relapses. And how it works is it closes the blood-brain barrier in the brain, and it prevents the immune system from sending antibodies to break down the myelin. So what is the blood-brain barrier? So the blood-brain barrier is similar to the phospholipid bilayer of the cell in that it uh, blocks it blocks invasive substances and hostile substances from infecting the brain or process or stopping processes in the brain. And so how corticosteroids work is it just, it closes the bar barrier to the immune system, which is what causes the, um, causes the multiple sclerosis. So the next pharmacolog pharmacological treatment is plasmapheresis. And plasmapheresis is usually used as a secondary treatment if corticosteroids don't react well to the patient. 
excuse me, and what happens is uh, an individual individual with MS will have their plasma uh, their plasma taken uh, in a in a will have their blood drawn, and the plasma in the in that blood sample will be exchanged for the plasma substitute. And essentially, what this does it it removes the uh, circulating antibodies which are causing the demyelination. And another phrase for this for plasma phoresis is called bl a blood cleansing therapy. And so that these two therapies specifically target uh, the the internal symptoms. So let's talk about the external symptoms like our um, mental condition and also our um, the physical symptoms. So cognitive behavioral therapy, it targets the depression, anxiety, other mental illnesses that come from multiple sclerosis. And what cognitive behavioral therapy does, it's usually a talk therapy with a medical professional like a psychologist or a therapist. Um, and then another therapy is physical therapy. It's exactly how it sounds. It's usually just physical activity or exercises to help regain m muscle control and kind of help uh, help uh, gain some of the, those function back in some more of the limbs that may have been damaged by multiple sclerosis. So this is just a clinical tri uh, clinical trial I looked at of cognitive behavioral therapy. I'll kind of just do a quick overview. But essentially what happened was uh, there were there were two groups. One group had uh, received uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and one received just uh, MS related education. And they based on three, they based the effectiveness of, e of each on Three scores: the pain severity score, which is how many, um, how many, uh, how much pain the MS patients reported; the depression score, which is how many uh, depressive symptoms they reported; and the treatment credibility score, which is how credible they felt the treatment was. So, as you can see in the graph on the left, uh, so there's a large in the post-treatment pain severity score. There's not much of a difference between. Um, the two groups. However, the cognitive behavioral therapy group uh, did uh, increase, was a little bit higher than the other group. And what this basically means is that cognitive behavioral therapy may not uh, directly impact the physical pain of the patient, but it's completely different in the depression score because as you can see, the uh, education group reported a lot more uh, depressive symptoms than the other group. And what this um, what this implies is that the cognitive behavioral therapy directly targets the mental condition like depression and anxiety and is truly effective. And so the last score I looked at was uh, the treatment credibility score. Um, it, this was just, it was not uh, entirely t essential to the testing the effectiveness, but what it kind of means is that the co cognitive behavioral therapy group felt that their treatment was more credible or more leg legitimate than the, edu uh, the education group. So some of my final conclusions were that corticosteroids are far more effective amongst the pharmacological treatments because it directly impedes the demyelination and it prevents nerve inflammation. And it also was created uh, for the, um, the it created to impede constant relapse that you can see in RRMS. And I also saw that although cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't stop the demyelination or anything like that, it does prove very effective in stopping the mental illness part of multiple sclerosis. So what's the future of multiple sclerosis? What are treatments looking at like? So there are current clinical trials investigating a new therapy called hemopoietic stem cell therapy. Uh, what this is, it's a chemotherapy that wipes out the immune, entire immune system and regrows it through stem cells. And like most chemotherapies, it is very painful and, um, but it, uh, clinical trials have proven this to be proven, uh, this therapy to be very uh, promising and, um, and it, many other experimental therapies are, are being are in clinical trials right now. So before I conclude for today, I would just like to thank my mentor, Brianna, for being so understanding and supporting me throughout this entire journey um, and just helping me organize my thoughts and um, help, my, help me with my review and everything like that. And I, also, I would also like to thank Polygents for allowing me this opportunity to create this project and also showcase it here. Um, so if you have any questions, I can take them now or you can just reach out to me at this email. Thank you. Woo, thank you so much. And so we can put questions into the chat or the q and I'll start us off, kind of a general question, but within your experience and learning about this, what was most surprising to you or what was an insight that you gained that uh, kind of changed your perspective on things? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, um, this was a lot of research because um, I wasn't entirely experienced when I started. Um, but something that really surprised me was how many um, how many 
how much little research had been done on my what my specific topic was because multiple sclerosis is a disorder that affects a lot of people, like millions of people, not not only in the United States, but over the world. So I was just really surprised to see how little research had been done. Um, there, ha there hadn't been any like kind of a lot of reviews done on all the different kinds of therapies and their effectiveness. Um, so that was just something that surprised me, but I was really thankful for this opportunity to contribute to um, contribute to that research and kind of help the community. Awesome. Um, hi, I'll, uh, I'll ask my question. Um, that was really great. That was a really comprehensive overview of a lot of different topics. Um, I'm going to ask you to pull up your slides again. I'd like to go back to the, um, the graph about cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is kind of your, uh, your main point of saying that CBT um, could improve the mental effects of it. Um, so I'm guessing we're looking at the very middle and looking at the orange versus the gray. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the error bars that you've included, those look like they're really overlapping um, and it doesn't seem to be statistically um, significantly different. Were there conclusions drawn from the paper of this about why they think this might be effective? Yes, so um, I, I, so in this presentation, I just looked over the, um, the original data just because I kind of want, it's just an overview. But yes, so in my paper, I did look at the error bars and how they might have been, um, they might, this might have shown a different conclusion. So um, yeah, the error bars, they do overlap quite a bit. And I thought this might be because um, the second group, they received an MS related education. Um, I thought this, and but both groups received standard care, and so I felt that because they both received the same care, there might be that's why there's uh, this uh, big overlap, and so that was the conclusion I drew from this data. Okay, is the just out of curiosity, is the control group getting standard care as well? Do you know? Yes, the control the control control group is just standard care. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. And if there are any other questions, feel free feel free to put them in the chat or to request to um, ask them live. But I do want to thank you so much, all of our presenters today, for all of the hard work on your projects. And a, a huge thank you as well to all of the audience members that came to support uh, these students during their presentations. We're really proud of all of the achievements of our students at Polygents, and we're so glad that we got to cheer you on and celebrate you uh, today on the stage. Uh, and we encourage you to stick around today and uh, attend the other presentations so you can see uh, more into all of this exciting work that students have done this summer and beyond. And I do want to especially plug our keynote address that is uh, coming up uh, at this, depending on your time zone, it's going to start at the 15 minute uh, of the hour that we're in. Um, and we're really excited about that keynote as well. So do please uh, attend that as well as other events throughout uh, today. I'll hang around in the room for a little bit in case anyone has questions, but feel free to use the last few minutes to join the tail end of other presentations or to get ready for uh, attending others later. Thank you so much again and great job, everyone. <laughs>